We start a new series which will focus on Jewish law, the history of Jewish law. We'll go through the uh, sort of the different books on the uh, on the Jewish bookshelf to understand what what is their authority, what do we learn from them, etc. So obviously, we we'll start with the uh, the Tanakh, the Bible. the uh, The word Tanakh is made from the the acronym of Torah Nevim Ktuvim, Torah which comes from the Hebrew word lehorot, to teach. This is the more also, it's from the same root, Torah, more. So the Torah is a book of, of teachings, of instruction, of education. Then we have Nevi'im, Navi, prophet. So most of the, uh, um, the prophets are included in the three major Nevi'im, Yeshaya, Yirmiya, Yehezkel, and the minor prophets, the Tre'asa. And then we have Tudim, Scriptures, which we'll get to later. The uh, Jewish law is based mostly on the Torah. In the, the written law, when we speak about the written law, we refer to the Torah, not to the prophets and the scriptures, because the prophets and the scriptures are considered support, just uh, supportive evidence for the, for the way of practice, for the way of law, but not the instructions themselves. And Part of it is because it's more uh, told as a narrative, as a story, and not as an instruction. <coughs> and the other part is that um, the other cause, the reason is that sometimes we have what is called a uh, an exception. I mean, this is not this is not the practice, this is not the law. The prophet was told to do something uh, only for a short period or only one time uh, for sort of as an emergency uh, measure. So when we look at the at the Torah, the Torah has uh, is divided into Hamisha Humshe Torah, the five the five Humashim. Humash comes from the word Hamesh, five. That's a traditional division, and each each one of the books of the Torah of the five <coughs> Humashim has a, sort of a different theme and a different style, but also covers a completely different time span. Maybe the, more, the, the important thing to do when we approach the Torah is just to realize what is the time span covered in each one of the books. So when you come to Bereshit, the first, the first book, uh, Bereshit Genesis, spans several thousand years. Seven from, thousand. Yeah, from the time of creation, which we put aside the, the issue, um, because I'm not, we're not talking about theology, we're talking about uh, law. Without entering the question of creation, obviously the Torah does not tell us this is exactly the timeline of creation. We know today that it took about 15 billion years to get to human civilization. But from that moment on, the way it is described in Bereshit, several thousand years with the lifetime of Adam, Shet, Enosh, etc., until you get to Noah, and then the the forefathers of Abraham, Yaakov, and it ends with Yosef, uh, and his brothers in Egypt. There are no uh, laws, per se, in the book of Bereshit. There's no, there's no instruction saying, you must do this, or you must do that. Uh, in, right, so in later generations, people try to find halachot in, uh, in, the book of, in the book of Genesis, in the book of Bereshit, and partly because the first commentary that we find, those who traditionally study Rashi, Rashi says on the first uh, verse of Rashi, this commentary is, "Lo ayat tzarich latchilat Torah, ela me'achodesh azel lachem sheya mitzvah rishona shenitztavu ben Yisrael." He says the Torah should have ideally started with the twelfth chapter of the book of Shemot because of, of Exodus, because this is the first commandment that was given to the Israelites as a nation. He he gives his answer, but. The question, which came from the rabbis bef- way before him, the question remains, because it remains with the premise that the Torah is the book of laws. And if not for the laws, uh, if not for the, the reason that she mentions, we could really have started the Torah from the 12th chapter of Shemot. But, so some people are looking for laws in the book of Bereshit. But the, the, the truth is that Without the book of Bereshit, we would never have kept the rest of the Torah. If you look for the reason why 
How is it possible that the Jews adhered to the Torah with such devotion for so many years, for thousands of years? The answer, in my opinion, certainly is that the Torah ties our observance of the mitzvot to the life and the stories and the history of Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. It becomes part of your family tradition. When you think of the Torah, when you think of, uh, of doing uh, acts of loving kindness, you don't just think about it as something personal, but you think as, I'm following in the footsteps of Abraham. In all our prayers we say, Eloheinu v'leavotenu, Elo Abraham, Elo Yitzhak v'lo Yaakov. God of our fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov. You don't have anything similar in any other, in the other religions. And when you say the God of Abraham, you think of Abraham's life. You think of the, the trials that he went through. And the difficulties, including marital strife. He had, he had a confrontation with his wife because of Hagar. All these little things become part of the fabric of religion. And when you, when you fulfill the mitzvot, you observe the mitzvot, you connect to them as well. That is the importance of the book of Belashi. So, what Rashi has to do with that is, I said, I'm saying that the commentary of Rashi, saying that the Torah should have started with a mitzvah, sort of uh, crafted our, our mentality that we think that the Torah is only about mitzvot. The Torah is not about mitzvot. It's a way of life. And it's for a way of life, you need the family history. If the Torah would be like the other books of, of Halakha, Maimonides, for example, lists all the mitzvot, and you read them on Shavuot, 613 mitzvot. You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. You cannot do this, you cannot do this, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. And you read, and the Bedin has to do this. And okay, after a while, I said, yeah, enough, enough. I mean, not, not you, one generation, two generations, a hundred generations, they will, they, it will fall off. But people read the Torah, and they read about Abraham, and Isaac and Yaakov, and Yosef. You know, my father, every time he, he reads the story of Yosef and his brothers, he cries. He reads the Shnaim Nikra Vehat Targum, and you know, two Persian Sukim of the Torah, and then, and I would hear him every, every year. He would read the story out loud at home with a box of tissues next to him, and he's like, and, uh, uh, and he reads like when, the time when they throw Yosef into the pit, and he says, uh, and he can't, he can't take it away. So every year you read the same story, you cry again. It's, but you know what? It's amazing because you, you, you connect yeah. to the story and every year you have new insights yeah. through what you go, we, and you read Tehillim, for example, later on, you have Tehillim. It's part of our codex, even though if there are no laws in Tehillim, Tehillim never, I mean, there are certain things that Tehillim does speak about, it's all moral values. Who could dwell in the mount of the Lord? He says that. He whose hands are clean. His heart is, is clean. He who doesn't speak of bad of others. This, this is what... But when you read the Elim, you connect to it. You feel like you, you walk in the footsteps of David, of Abraham. That's the beauty of the Torah. Now, going back to the, to the question of mitzvot in Bereshit, Hayro, you mentioned that we have the, the first mitzvah is to be fruitful and multiply. That is... That is part of the oral law. That is the, how the rabbis interpreted the verse. And it was included in all the books of, of, that count the mitzvot later on. But come to think of it, the way it is written in the Torah is not a mitzvah. It says God blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply. And we see that all humanity sort of tries to keep this commandment. Actually, I have a good proof that it's not uh, technically a commandment. And that is that with all the other commandments, the, the rabbis and the religious leaders always have to, to preach and to convince people, you have to keep Shabbat, you have to eat kosher, it's important to do Brit Milah. Nobody says, to, has to go and preach, you have to have children. Most people will do it anyway, which is a proof it's not a mitzvah, otherwise they wouldn't want to do that. Um, and then you have the other one that you mentioned, Gita Nasheh, the sciatic nerve. That is interesting because it was included in the legal codex, it says, but the way it is written in the Torah is that Yaakov struggled with the angel and he hurt his sciatic nerve. And for that reason, the children of Israel would not eat the sciatic nerve until, nerve until today. But it's never written again in the Torah as a commandment. Um, well, like and, 
and, and which, by the way, the, you cannot eat the sciatic nerve. It's not edible. It's you really have to work hard to. It's 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 a sinew. It's very. Any case, go back to to the to the story of the sheet. Some people try to find to drive me to vote from it, but there's nothing there. As a, even the Brit the only one that you could look at is Brit Milah, that God tells Abraham you have to be circumcised, but that mitzvah is later on repeated. So it was given first to Abraham as a covenant, but later on. Now, if you want to review the whole thing, like by you no know, detail by detail, all of the commandments of Torah, I have a series on on speaker that's called the Semicha program, when I went like fourteen classes of an hour each about all the mitzvot in the Tanakh. As far as I can do so, that's a that's a different. So that's that's the scope of the book of Bereshit. I just want to talk about the scope of the books before we even start uh, into the history of of halacha. Uh, the book of Shemot is uh, has a shorter time span; it covers about three hundred years, more or less, from the time they came to Egypt to the time of the Exodus and. In, each, in, in the desert, the first couple of months in the desert when they build the, the Mishkan. In terms of halakha, also we have a lot of narrative. The first chapter is up until chapter 20, mostly stories of the slavery and the exodus. There are specific mitzvot of Pesach that are just for that time because later on the details will be different. But the you could say the maybe the center or the climax of the book of Shemot is Matan Torah, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, and then later on Parashat Mishpatim, which is uh, focused on mainly monetary laws, laws, financial laws, laws of damages, which also teaches us that the Torah does not separate the spiritual from the mundane. In order to be a good Jew, it's not enough to go to the synagogue and pray and eat kosher and keep Shabbat. Money should also be kosher, business ethics, etc. That's that's the book of Shemot. Then the the second half of Shemot is dedicated to the building of the Mishkan. No practical laws for us, because this was temporary, only in the in the in the desert. So question why what it was included? That's a separate question. Then the book of Aikra, which is called in uh, English Leviticus, because it was the book of the Levites. It all comes from the, the Greek names. Uh, so the book of the Levites or the Kohanim is <coughs> is is a book of laws. It's mostly laws, a very little narrative in in Vayikra, only about the death of the sons of Aharon. That's what we find there as a narrative, uh, and most of the laws are in, are not applicable today. It's about leprosy. It's about the the laws of the Kohanim, the laws of the temple, purity, impurity, um, and in terms of the time it covers. Could be one week. The only the, the story is told in, in Vaikra, one week, maybe a month. Uh, so, but it's amazing. It, it, we drop from thousands of years in, in, in Bereshit to hundreds in Shemot to maybe weeks in Vaikra. But in Vaikra, like in Shemot, the centerpiece, you could say, of Vaikra is Parashat Kedoshim, chapters 18, 19, where the focus again is. Uh, social uh, social norms how to behave towards each other do not curse a deaf person meaning don't say something about someone who cannot hear you do not offend uh, others uh, respect parents respect the elderly um, so this is the center of Aikra Bemidbar Bemidbar is the uh, that's a, we have a, have a mixture there it's its own theology Bamidbar covers about Bamidbar covers about forty years because that's that's the years that they spend in the desert. So you have about forty years, and uh, the message of Bamidbar is we do have laws in Bamidbar, uh, mostly the laws of korbanot and holidays, but in Bamidbar it's more about the message of what happens when people uh, refuse to follow in the path of Torah. And God teaches a lesson. He shows us in the beginning of Amidbar, God creates a beautiful system, like the, the most perfect government. The tribes, the chieftains, the, the Mishkan, boundaries, you know exactly where each person is. But then in chapter 11, people start complaining, we, we cannot do this, we need food. 
Even uh, we need food, we need water. Why did you take us out? Then even Moshe says, I don't know if I can be the leader. I cannot take, I cannot do it anymore. And then Miriam speaks about Moshe. And then the scouts come and say, we can't go to the land. And then Korah rebels against Moshe. So once one, if you don't have everyone in, in the nation, if everyone is not willing to participate and build the system, it's not going to work. To be the, the perfect form of government, even if God puts it in place, eventually it depends on the people. That's the message of a midbar. And uh, midbar is called numbers because it's constant, it started with the sense of the people. And finally, we have in the Torah the book of Devarim, which uh, in English is called Deuteronomy. It, come, it comes from the Greek Deutero is second, Nomi, Nomus is law. So the repetition of the law, and it was really a quote in Hebrew, for many in, in rabbinic literature, Mishneh Torah, the repetition of the Torah, and it covers about one month in terms of time, because those, those, this is the last month in Moshe's life. He gathers everyone in Arvot Moab, Mulyarden Yericho, on the plains of Moab, across from Yericho, before they cross uh, into Eretz Israel. He retells them briefly the story of the Exodus, and... He gives all the laws of the Torah, many laws that do not appear in the other books. And then he seals with the rebuke of Kitavo, the, the curses of Kitavo and Shirat Azinu, the, the, the poem of Azinu, which is uh, the covenant between Am Israel and, and Hashem. So each, each Humash has its own style. We sometimes don't pay attention to it because you read it every week, one portion, one portion. But you have to look at the full picture and it's good to read it in in uh, in sequence, all of them, uh, one following the other, but that just to to, to take a, to get a, a sense of where in the Torah we find laws. So now, as a result of that structure, you have laws of the Torah uh, scattered in the Torah, not always in a in an organized manner. All the laws, all the financial laws, all the laws of Shabbat, all the laws of 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 the holidays, and that paves the way for the next uh, stage, which is Midrash Halakha, which we'll talk about tomorrow.